makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Good morning and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Anna Edwards in London, in for Francine Lacroix this morning. Here's what's coming up on today's programme. The global sell-off continues after private hiring data in the United States comes in over twice estimates, driving up Treasury yields. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen voices concerns over China's metals curves, but says the US needs to diversify, not decouple, from China. And Alibaba surges after a report that China will announce a $1.1 billion fine on its Ant fintech affiliate, drawing a line under the probe. Welcome to The Pulse, everybody. It is Friday morning. Let's have a look at what Friday's markets have for us. And we can see that the stocks picture for Europe is a negative one, down by three-tenths of 1% on the stocks Europe 600. And this follows real weakness yesterday. We were down on the stocks 50 by 2.9% yesterday. So the pain in terms of that stock sell-off really falling on Europe yesterday. As the US recovered a bit yesterday, we thought that perhaps the European session might be brighter. It is not. We are down another three-tenths of a percent. Not like yesterday in terms of the scale of the sell-off, but certainly still negative. Uh, in terms of sectors, we have most sectors in negative territory. Interesting that it is some of the defensives that are lower, like utilities, and some of the more, uh, uh, more uh, related to the global economy, like basic resources and chemicals, actually going higher, along with travel and leisure and banks. So an interesting sector breakdown this morning. Uh, we've got uh, US futures pointing lower. The two-year yields at 4.97%. That yield has been over 5% yesterday. And again, once again, during the Asia session, you can see that we've got some buying of that two-year, though, going on, and that yield coming down just a touch this morning 108.72 on euro dollar let's have a look at the map then and uh, we'll link we'll uh, linger on the map just a moment to show you what's uh, happening across these european equity markets and the uh, the red that we're seeing broadly across these uh, european markets in fact we've got a global map for you which is very special but the uh, european uh, picture uh, you, can, you can see the asian picture that's the handover that we're dealing with here in europe and the asia picture was still quite backward looking down eight tenths of one percent on msci asia pacific that then flows into the european session and uh, we are negative for much of Europe. Joining us now, Bloomberg's Christine Aquino here to take us through some of the market moving uh, thoughts this morning. I mean, Christine, what do you make of this market session? We had expected that perhaps we'd bounce a little bit because the profile of the US session yesterday was a big sell-off on the ADP number, rightly perhaps because of concerns about what that does to yields and rates. Uh, but then we sort of managed to recover and we thought perhaps Europe would uh, get a bit of a bounce as we wait for the payrolls data today. That's not come to pass. No such thing as a turnaround Friday, unfortunately, Anna. And I think that really just speaks to how fragile market sentiment is at the moment. I mean, what we saw yesterday was incredible, especially in terms of how those yields really got to highs that we haven't seen since 2008 or even earlier and I think this really just speaks to the markets very very being very very jittery about where the Federal Reserve and all these other central banks are going to go next and it seems like all paths really leading to ever higher interest rates from here and the ADP figure definitely contributing to that and you know we haven't really seen a trend where non-farm payrolls are diverging mm. from what we see in the ADP figure so far and so I think the expectation is that what we'll see from uh, the official stats today is more confirmation of a robust U.S. labor market. Yeah, so we're looking for 230,000 or so in terms of job creation today in the non-farm payrolls report. There isn't always that robust link, as you as you mentioned, between ADP and non-farm. So I guess we bear that in mind when we think about how high this could go. But as Paul Dobson was, was pointing out to us earlier, the whisper number has been rising on non-farms post-ADP. Absolutely, Anna. And yeah, I, I, because I think investors have been burned before in thinking that, oh, you know, mm -hmm. not necessarily a link, so perhaps there could be some opportunities to trade, some of the differences there. But by and large, just the direction of travel for most labor market indicators in the U.S. just really pointing to a very, very, very strong market, despite the fact that we've been seeing rate hikes from the Federal Reserve for more than a year now, you know. And, and I think in, in some ways that is a positive for the Fed, especially if we see other signs of inflation and cooling because then you get the ideal Fed scenario, full employment, but also costs under control. So definitely something to watch for in today's numbers. Christine, stay with us. Christine Aquino joining us from the Markets Today team with thoughts on the markets so far and what we've seen, this negative sentiment for risk assets as a result of strong labor market data out of the U.S. and higher U.S. yields. Well, let's focus on uh, some geopolitics for a moment. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is meeting Chinese Premier Li Chang today. That's after discussions with former counterpart Liu He and the PBOC 
Lady's Yi Gang, which a US official described as substantive. She also spoke at a roundtable with US business leaders operating in China. We saw pictures of that earlier on, saying she was concerned about Beijing's export curbs. Here's what else she had to say. I've made clear that the United States <clears throat> does not seek a wholesale separation of our economies. We seek to diversify and not to decouple. A decoupling of the world's two largest economies would be destabilizing for the global economy, and it would be virtually impossible to undertake. So diversify, not decouple, that mantra that we've heard from many, many U.S. and perhaps European officials visiting China uh, of late. Now, Bloomberg's Lucille Liu joins us now with some analysis. Lucille, good to speak to you. So what else are we expecting then from this visit? Yeah, I mean, so the uh, the meeting with the premier we're expecting to happen in the next hour. Of course, Yellen has already met with some of China's economic team. Um, uh, the U.S. is basically castless as, you know, reestablishing re-establishing those lines of communication sort of with old friends but also with this you know the new leaders um, as especially as China has gone through this twice a decade sort of leadership reshuffle and we're still seeing um, many of these people come into place and in the top positions um, so I think we had David Lohinger on earlier today who said you know this is about you want to build those relationships uh, before a crisis happens um, and so I think it really depends on how much you put in sort of personal relationships and trust, um, especially uh, with how the U.S.-China relationship has been going. Uh, of course, on the other hand, we have also seen quite prominent Chinese academics saying things like, you know, you could talk every day, but if the two sides are going to take action that's going to hurt each other's core interests, uh, those talks mm. are just going to be symbolic. Yes, I mean, Janet Yellen giving her perspective on that, I suppose, and talking about what it is that motivates the United States and what it is that doesn't motivate the US here. Yellen, in that press conference a little earlier, or those, those comments we saw there with business leaders, voiced some US concern over China's export controls on two key metals, because this visit comes just after we'd heard from China on its limits of a couple of metals. What's the, what's the, the risk here for China in introducing these new restrictions? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We've seen this before, um, you know, in 2010, when we had that fishing boat incident uh, with Japan and between Japan and China, uh, China, of course, put on these temporary curbs. Um, and that's led to, you know, China accounting for basically 90 percent of global output on rare earth um, and in a decade's time going down to something like 70 percent. So, you know, it, the, it risks huge. Uh, there is, you know, the risk of backfire with something like this, where other countries who aren't already uh, considering diversifying supply chains would look to do so. Um, so it certainly signals that China is willing to put out, um, you know, these these new initiatives that uh, are going to inflict real pain, but may also have collateral mm. damage. We saw Blinken in China. We've seen Janet Yellen in China. Uh, Lucille, what are the other high level talks that we're expecting this year? Yeah, we've had some uh, people familiar reporting that uh, John Kerry may be coming also this month, uh, maybe mid this month. And of course, uh, we've also already had the commerce chief uh, from the Chinese side go over to Washington. And uh, Tsing Gong, the foreign minister, has also uh, pledged to go sometime this year after the, his talks with Blinken. So we are seeing those high level talks happening at a very rapid pace. Um, I think eyes are, of course, on the G20 uh, in September, APEC in November to see if the presidents of the two countries will meet and maybe, you know, put this relationship back onto, as they say, more steady footing. Lucille, thanks very much. Lucille Liu joining us there with the latest on that, that meeting between Janet Yellen and many uh, senior Chinese officials. Uh, let's bring uh, Bloomberg's Christine Aquino back into the conversation. And Christine, some of the sort of bright, brighter mood music around that meeting, you might have expected that that would boost risk sentiment on any other day. But given the jobs picture from yesterday and the higher yield story, that's really um, overruling any positivity that might come from conversations taking place between these two global powers. Absolutely. And I think the picture right now is really just too muddy. And, and even within uh, the US-China relationship and how that impacts market sentiment, at best, 
it has been really quite lukewarm and lackluster in terms of that effect. I mean, we have seen, for instance, Secretary of State Antony Blinken visiting uh, China very recently as well. We've heard some very conciliatory words. As you mentioned, we've heard this whole um, diversification uh, decoupling mm. line from several uh, U.S. officials now. But when you just kind of look at the actions of, of both countries, it, it, it kind of um, pours a little bit of cold water over those very warm, yes. conciliatory And we words, are actually right? starting to see some of that diversification coming through in some of the trade days. So the Waco function has showed sort of peak trade between China and the U.S. for a long time in dollar terms. Um, but, but now we're starting to see as a percentage of trade, actually their reliance on each other declining, as Tom was pointing out to me last hour. So that's an interesting one to watch. Christine, thank you very much. Christine Aquino joining us from the Markets Today blog with her thoughts uh, on what's going on on the markets today. Uh, we sit here in Europe, down four-tenths of one percent on the stock 600. We'll get more on the markets shortly. This is Bloomberg. I remain concerned about whether inflation will return to target in a sustainable and timely way. And I think more restrictive monetary policy will be needed to achieve the FOMC's goals of stable prices and maximum employment. As Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas President Laurie Logan there saying more rate hikes will likely be needed to contain inflation. Let's speak now to Miles Bradshaw, Global Head of Aggregate Strategies for Fixed Income at JP Morgan Asset Management. Miles, very nice to have you with us. Let me get your take on bond markets then. As a result of that ADP print yesterday, uh, it was two times what had been expected in terms of job creation. How much uh, has this shifted your view of how high rates go in the US or is it still within the realms of what you'd expected? Well, well, the data was was surprisingly strong, but I think we need to put in context. ADP is not traditionally a good leading indicator on what's going to happen to payroll. But in the context of the whole data with the PMI service data and the general resilience of the economy, it fits a narrative that actually, not just the US, but the global economy is actually more resilient than people would have thought uh, three to six months ago. And that's why you're seeing bond yields adjusting higher. Um, I think from if our we, perspective, yeah. what matters, is, is where we are in the economic cycle and the valuations that you get from investing in bonds. So that's that's from our perspective that this is becoming interesting opportunities to indeed increase our bond allocations. OK, and where do you do that, Miles? Well, in, in terms of the globally, I think the US is the most interesting part. You've had rates that have moved the most. You've got a very interest sensitive uh, economy and you've got plenty of room to cut rates. I think the UK is also becoming very interesting. UK bonds are very cheap versus both the US and Europe. You've got interest rates that are pushing markets expecting rates to go up to six and a half percent. And I think the struggle in terms of positioning is about the timing of the recession and about what appears to be the lags of monetary policy being indeed longer than they, they used to. But from a, a geopolitical perspective, you know, if we look globally, I think it's the US and the UK are more interesting. And from a sector perspective, there are lots of cheap sectors in fixed income, uh, for example, agency mortgages, European uh, government related bonds that are also attractive just in terms of their spreads uh, versus government bonds. Mm. Can I ask you more about your guilt's view? I mean, how likely do you think it is that we get to that six and a half percent? I suppose you don't think so it, 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 from, from what you said about the, your appetite for guilt. It, it, I think that really depends on on the Bank of England's reaction function. And this is where it's difficult with a nine-person committee to actually give a clear message. They can either keep rates at, say, five and a half, six for a longer period of time, and that could be a signal, therefore, that you're going to squeeze the inflation out slowly but surely. Or they could jack rates up more aggressively and squeeze a smaller section of population longer. So I'm not really so focused about exactly what will be the peak level of bank rate in the UK. I'm looking at the long-term guilt and looking at its global valuations. And what I think is clear is the Bank of England are committed to bringing inflation under control. And that ultimately gives me confidence that the inflation anchor will be met and a recession becomes more likely in the UK. And that's what I think makes long-term gilts more attractive when I look at the global stack of, of opportunities we have out there. Yeah, if you look at UK yields, yielding more than uh, some peripheral Eurozone countries that typically it has not yielded more than, does that need, does that correct at some point? I think so. And I think we all know that, you know, there's been lots of positive surprises in the UK. The economy has been stronger. Inflation has been the main outlier that has been higher than expected. And so I think what the market is struggling with is the positioning. 
Uh, people have been overweight, UK gilts. Inflation has come in higher. Interest rate expectations have gone up more. And that is resulting in the market cheapening up. And as an active in long-term investor, that's the opportunity. You want to be buying cheap assets. Uh, it's not clear what the catalyst will be at this stage and how quickly uh, gilt yields will turn. So really, it's about sizing your positions accordingly. Uh, but you should be increasing your positions into a sector, a market that is cheapening and is cheap uh, when you look at long-term valuations. Yeah, back to the US a conversation, Miles. And, and how much is your thinking evolving around recession risk? How convinced are you now versus months ago that we head into recession in the US? Well, I th you know, as a house, we've had a view of recession for, for a number of quarters. Uh, and we recently revisited that and we reaffirmed that we think a recession is the ultimate outcome. But what was clear is the lags of monetary policy are longer. And there's lots of, of reasons for that. Uh, principally about the aftershocks from COVID and the strength of balance sheets. So as I see it, it's quite clear that central banks are committed to bringing inflation down. Our analysis would suggest inflation is coming down in the US, but not to the 2% run rate that the Fed can declare victory and to pivot. And you know, recent papers from, from Bernanke, for example, recent speeches from the ECB quite clearly illustrate that central bankers want to ease the labour market. And that means that more likely central bankers are going to create an economic policy uh, constellation that will deliver recession. And that recession has implications not for just interest rates where they go, but also for credit spreads where they actually start to perform. So I think our, we still be, believe in... Hmm. Issue is the, I was just going to say, delivering... Yeah. OK, it's the timing. If we see recessions delivered by global central banks, will that be defined as a mistake? I mean, obviously, it'll have specific impacts around the labour markets and around aggregate demand, and that might all be intentioned. But if they go so far as to deliver recession, is that a mistake? So it's a really good question. That I think politically uh, there will be lots of uh, pointed questions, and uh, central bankers will be targeted for supposedly generating a uh, recession. But in fact, what's happened is demand is too strong for the level of supply in the economy. And so we need to lower demand and we need to do it in a way that is is gradual. And it's very difficult to do that when you've got a period where you've had 15 years of very easy monetary policy. So I, I think it is it's part of of a necessary part of controlling inflation is to lower demand. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a mistake. It's, it's not it's not a good thing to create a recession. So in that sense, it's a mistake. Mm. But central banks have a few good alternative paths at the moment. Uh, and I think Miles, the result thanks. will be that by the economy, you're going you're gonna to get the recession. Miles, thanks very much for your time. Miles Bradshaw, Global Head of Aggregate Strategies at JP Morgan Asset Management. Coming up on the programme, we look ahead to next week's NATO summit. Is there a path to membership for Ukraine? We discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Eighty-six percent of Ukraine citizens are eager to be part of NATO. It's our choice. Also, President Zelensky mentioned that we expect our alliance will invite Ukraine to join. So this is my response to you. So we expecting some good signals from NATO. That was Ukraine's finance minister in that exclusive conversation with Bloomberg, with my colleague Maria Tadeo, and uh, she's our European correspondent, of course, and she joins us now. Maria, what were your key takeaways then from your discussion with Ukraine's finance minister? Uh, yeah, of course, uh, Sergei Marchenko, who in many ways, Anna, to me, he represents what is this new and uh, modern generation of diplomats that work in the Ukrainian government. Obviously, the more you get to know the Ukrainian government, you realize there's a lot of very, very young uh, diplomats that operate here that are in important uh, jobs and positions of power from 35 to 45 and who are convinced on two ideas. One is that they have to reform the country. Otherwise, there's no way to enter the European Union, and that is their political uh, aspiration, but also this idea of corruption and the oligarchs that continues to hinder uh, 
uh, the Ukrainian economy. A lot of the message uh, that he told us today is that we have no choice but to reform and crack down on corruption when it comes to Ukraine. Because, Anna, they need, obviously, the private money, but they also need to prove to their mm. allies, the European Union and the United States, that there is value for money. The other point that okay. he noted is that still for this year, when it comes to the budget, they're doing well. But next year, it's going to be challenging again. Very quickly, uh, you uh, were at the NATO headquarters yesterday. What's the latest on Sweden? Uh, and a complicated situation, of course, in an ideal world, they would have been ratified already and become a member and get that in the NATO summit. Instead, what we will have is a meeting between the Swedish prime minister and President Erdogan on Monday. Maybe there's a breakthrough on that. If not, there may be a cold shower for Sweden. The talks continue and obviously there's no clear guidance on the ratification. Mm. Maria, thank you very much. Maria today, our Europe correspondent. Something different when we come back. We'll be talking coffee. We'll be speaking to the chairman of Lavazza Group. That conversation, it takes in margins, though, a really interesting one uh, in a rising price environment. This is Greenberg. Welcome back to The Pulse. Uh, I'm Anna Edwards, in for Francine Lacroix this morning. Now, the global sell-off continues after private hiring data in the U.S. comes in over twice estimates, driving up Treasury yields. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen voices concerns over China's metals curves, but says the U.S. needs to diversify, not decouple, from the country. And Alibaba surges after a report that China will announce a $1.1 billion fine on its Ant Fintech affiliates, drawing a line perhaps under the tech pro. Good morning. Welcome to The Pulse. Uh, I'm Anna Edwards, as I said. Let's get to a, an important morning conversation around coffee. Arabica coffee futures rebounded in New York after dropping to the lowest in five months as weakening prices are seen boosting the premium beans. Italian coffee maker Lavazza says a narrowing cost premium between Arabica and Robusta means roasters could start shifting back to the former as the price of the high-end beans Falls. Let's talk coffee then with Gi uh, Giuseppe Lavazza, who's chairman of the Lavazza Group. Very nice to see you, Giuseppe, with Good me morning. here in London. Thank you for, for joining us. Let's start with the, the coffee price then, as it has been such a topic of conversation. People who get up early in the morning to work in international television are obsessed with coffee, drinking coffee, and therefore the price of it to some degree. So what are you seeing in these coffee markets in terms of the pricing and your expectations for the rest of the year? For the rest of the year, I think that uh, we have reached already a top uh, um, uh, price record uh, in uh, Robusta uh, after 15 years. Uh, and now there is a, a sort of uh, uh, different move movement down of the price of Robusta that is uh, uh, quite uh, lower uh, respect to uh, the price that the, the coffee had uh, uh, four weeks ago. Mm. So this is a good news. I think that uh, uh, new... Um, um, bearish elements uh, are entering into the market uh, for Robusta as well for uh, Arabica. Uh, as you know, uh, the coffee market uh, uh, was put under uh, unprecedented pressure for uh, the frost that uh, affected Brazil in uh, July 2021. And after that, uh, starting from October 2022, a big rally on Robusta coffee mm. due to two factors, speculation from one side, a, a gap between uh, supply and demand due to the fact that many roasters decided to shift from a, a very high expensive Arabica coffee towards a cheaper Robusta. Okay. Uh, okay, so the frost in Brazil dr sort of starting dr dr driving some of that. Um, let me ask you about how you... Uh, so the prices that you're paying, or your, your costs, I guess, in focus there in that conversation. But I want to ask you about your margins, because you put out a, an interesting statement over the last couple of days saying that you're forecasting a double-digit decrease in earnings before interest. And this, it seems, to some degree, because you are planning to absorb higher costs yourself and not pass those on to customers. Why have you made that decision? This is part of our strategy to try to protect the consumer from one side and our sale from the other side. We know that in the coffee market that these kind of spikes and hikes in coffee is quite common. It's, it's a cycle, it's a, it's a commodity. It happened, it already happened in the past time, but it lasts uh, maybe a couple of years and then the normal price uh, are again uh, available for uh, the traders and for the roasters. So it's just a question of time you know, to 
try to resist uh, and to be resilient uh, to a situation that now is difficult, but maybe starting from 2024 uh, will be much better. So we decided to absorb part of this cost. Of course, uh, uh, the cost of coffee is not uh, the only cost that we have to deal with. We have, of course, uh, as many other industry troubles with uh, the inflation and it is striking very, very uh, highly. Our balance sheet, uh, energy cost, the gas cost, uh, for example, or freight cost, uh, mm. packaging. Uh, yes. So we had really to deal with a huge amount of cost increase, about uh, 550 million euros uh, in two years. So we decided not to pass, of course, all this cost uh, to the consumer because we're very concerned about the general situation. Uh, the cost of living crisis, of course, uh, is everywhere, not only UK. Uh, Households are struggling, of course, with uh, the price of many goods. Uh, Maybe we are in the edge of the recession, okay. interest rates. So for this reason, we decided to try to just pass a few percentage of the cost to consumers. OK, that's interesting. So just a few percent passed on. So broadly protecting consumers and taking this on your own margin. Giuseppe, from what you say, though, I'm not sure is that because you're just very kind people or is that because maybe you don't have the pricing power so you don't think consumers will pay higher prices what's the driving force first of all uh, uh, the company is not listed so we are not under pressure of analysts uh, to show every day a very strong uh, bottom line so we are here for the long term uh, it's a family company privately held so we can accept uh, to reduce our margin for maybe even a couple of years uh, to be ready to restart uh, in a better position in terms of sales uh, and market shares when we know that the cost will decline and it will happen in uh, probably likely uh, at the end of the year 2024 will be a different year mm. and so for this reason we have decided to try to um, as uh, to put on this kind of strategy that really is protecting our sales protecting our market share protecting the consumers okay so you might increase market share out of this as a result do you see others in either the coffee space or in the uh, packaged consumer goods space do you do you see others behaving in a similar way or do you think they're taking a different approach uh, many of uh, uh, many uh, many companies in the coffee are listed companies so they are really to protect uh, the margins and to show a very good uh, financial results uh, for us, it uh, was different and our strategy was very well rewarded because during 2022, we saw a lot of uh, good increase in volumes in all our geographies, in UK as well. So uh, I think that it's, uh, it was a good choice uh, mm. and allowed us uh, to uh, push uh, to grow the company for the next futures. How have we seen an evolution in the, uh, the, the way that people enjoy coffee in recent years? Because during lockdowns, when we saw lockdowns across many geographies, people had to suddenly, as you said in your notes this morning, become expert uh, baristas themselves at home. And then there's been this sort of revenge socialising that's taken place since lockdown. How do you see consumption now? Where do we want to consume coffee? Yeah, we, we saw a lot of uh, shift uh, of behavior in, 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 in consuming coffee, especially here in the UK, where the beans market, for example, is moving exactly from the reason you mentioned. I mean, during the lockdown, people were forced to stay home. But, uh, of course, uh, everyone wanted to enjoy again the coffee society experience they mm. have abroad. So many of them became a self-taught barista, buying an espresso machine, even expensive. Uh, full automatic espresso machine that started being beans. Uh, and so they prepare at home uh, uh, the recipes and the coffee they used to have outside of home. This kind of trend is still there. And the bean market is moving more or less everywhere. In UK, as in France, as in Italy, as in Germany. So it's just an example of how um, consumer behavior is uh, has changed during the period of time of the pandemic. Mm. And is it a fight to, to uh, is it a fight against tea in the UK still, uh, Giuseppe, or are you... Uh... You're no, not, you're not in that battle. No, it's a find uh, uh, inside the coffee business uh, uh, among instant coffee. There was yes. a traditionally the way British people enjoy coffee many years ago. And the roast and ground, uh, the beans, uh, the capsule, uh, the big revolution and transform uh, the coffee consumption uh, in this country since 1990. OK, and we don't all have to choose. We can do both. Giuseppe, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Giuseppe Lovazza, chairman of Lovazza Group. Coming up on the programme, chipping away at profits, Samsung sees its worst decline in quarterly sales in more than a decade, fueling chip demand worries. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Thank you.
the conversations that matter and the insights you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Anna Edwards in for Francine Lacroix here in London. Uh, Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary, is of course in China making a visit, speaking to business leaders there and also uh, very senior politicians. Some news lines coming through from her now saying she hopes that the visit can create more regular communication. Uh, she says the US seeks healthy competition that isn't winner takes all. And she also says that a fair set of rules can benefit both the US and China over time. And we shouldn't let any US-China disagreements worsen ties. So very constructive uh, language coming through from the US Treasury Secretary. Uh, we will see uh, where this geop ge geopolitics settles after her visit. Now, oil is headed for a second weekly gain after OPEC Plus leaders Saudi Arabia and Russia tightened supplies and US crude stockpiles fell. Crude has dropped more than 10% this year as the global economy slows. But in an exclusive interview with Bloomberg, Oman's transport minister said he's unconcerned. $80 is not a problem for Oman going forward, but also the past two to three years have witnessed a lot of improvements in decision making in other sectors and also positioning the country in uh, the for the diversification purpose when it comes to the logistics, mining, uh, the developments that you've seen a lot uh, recently when it comes to green hydrogen in the country. Recently, uh, the last contract or the last, uh, uh, the last promise was a signature for a $6.7 billion uh, worth of investment in green hydrogen mm. by, uh, by a JV led by POSCO, for example. 20 billion plus when it comes to green hydrogen, uh, a lot of improvements when it comes to also other sectors, the logistics, the growth of logistics have rebound last year by about 19%, 5% uh, of logistics this year when it comes to the contribution to the economy, much higher than uh, what we've uh, seen in the past. Also, uh, the sectors of fisheries, mm -hmm. the sectors that comes to uh, the improvements in terms of mining is also uh, noticeable. Okay, so let's, unpack some, let's unpack some of that then. Right. And, and on green hydrogen, I know your targets are very ambitious there as well. How much progress have you made in attracting that investment in green hydrogen into Oman? First, there was a commitment that was announced by the country when it comes to the contribution to uh, curb down of emissions globally. Oman has announced its target. 2050 mm -hmm. is the target for carbon neutrality. But a lot of activity by the ministries, all of them, but led by the Ministry of Energy and Mining when it comes to attracting foreign direct investment. Roughly $20 billion worth of deals has been signed. And this is because of the nature of the country. A large parts of the country enjoys high intensity of sun and wind at the same time. And, the, and thus, there is a lot of signatures when it comes to the production of green hydrogen, but also the use of green hydrogen in terms of produ producing green metals, etc. So, uh, at least for different uh, signatures that has, uh, has, has, has happened only this year alone, more than $10 billion. That was Oman's Transport Minister, Saeed Al Mawali, speaking exclusively to Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie about their expectations for oil prices and what it means for their economy. Now, let's talk about tech. Alibaba has uh, closed out the week as the biggest gainer on the Hang Seng Index today. That's after a Reuters report said that the Chinese authorities are likely to announce a $1.1 billion fine on Ant Group, which, of course, Alibaba owns 30-odd 30 30 percent of, investors hoping it could mark a possible end of government scrutiny on Chinese tech. Joining us now from Hong Kong, Bloomberg's Charlotte Yang with details. So, Charlotte, what do we know about what is likely to, to happen here with this fine on Ant and what it means? Yeah, so there are a few key points that we need to dig deeper here. So the Reuters report said that Chinese authorities are likely to announce an at least a billion penalty on Ant Group, which is a financial um, tech arm of of Alibaba, and that um, this, you know, this sum it might look very big and staggering, but it's actually investors told us that it's actually manageable for Ant Group if you put it into more context, which, you know, the estimated um, earnings for the December quarters actually came higher than that, and that the more significant of this penalty is that if this is confirmed by the Chinese authorities, and that it could mark, you know, the end of a regulatory overhaul of for for years, you know, of this um, Chinese of, event, and that could be seen as a positive for the sector as well. Charlotte, thank you very much. Uh, and certainly it could be a positive for the sector. And that seems to be uh, towards the end of the day in Hong Kong, what, what the markets were thinking and starting to price in. Bloomberg's Charlotte Yang in Hong Kong. Sticking with tech theme, Samsung has reported its worst decline in quarterly revenue since at least 2009. Uh, it comes off the back of weakening demand in the memory chips 
market. Despite recent production cuts, the larger than expected 22% drop in sales sent the stock sliding in Seoul. For more, we're joined now by Alex Webb from Bloomberg Quick Take. Alex, give us uh, what stood out uh, for you from this story. Well, I think the most interesting thing actually is the kind of share price reaction, which is a 2.4, I think it was, percent decline in Seoul. Actually, not as bad given some of the numbers as you might otherwise have expected. What's happened clearly is that the memory market still isn't brilliant. We'd seen a few signs of positivity from Micron and SK Hynix, who were the other kind of big players in that space. Don't forget memory market, memory chips, highly commoditized. This is very different from the sort of bleeding edge NVIDIA stuff where only a handful of companies can do it. It's quite easy to replicate this stuff. But Samsung, unlike its peers, had been quite slow to say we're going to cut production on that. So there's a huge build-up inventory. Loads of their customers have these memory chips. They're working through those at the moment. Samsung only now really starting to cut back on manufacturing. Mm. So there, there's expectation from the market that the situation will improve, clearly not being brilliant at the moment. Right, there are chips and there are chips, and often that's important when you're thinking about how these stories read across into other businesses. But is there global impact then or global messaging from this story? I mean, you know, we've... I think the lessons almost are that actually when you see the market starting to become over full, maybe you should be cutting your mm. c uh, capacity a little bit sooner. I feel for them though because all the way through the pandemic we just kept talking to these chip companies about how quickly can you ramp up production? When are we going to get more production online? Because everyone was scrambling for technology. Well that's the thing with the chip industry as a whole is that it's a sort, always a sort of concertina effect, right? Because it takes about 18 months to ramp up any sort of production so that when you see a kind of trough of there not being enough supply, they start saying, okay, we'll build up production. By the time production comes in in 18 months time, there might actually no, no longer be the demand and you have oversupply. So you, that's consistently been the case in the semiconductor industry it is something that actually chip makers had been trying to say certainly pre-pandemic was no longer the case we've over mm. overcome this sort of boom and bust as it were it's clearly not the case at the moment and certainly not in the memory chip space okay alex thank you very much bloomberg's alex webb joining us from bloomberg quick take with the latest then on that drop in the samsung share price as a result of its latest commentary on chips let's get to some breaking news coming through from the netherlands the dutch government can limit skipol airport capacity uh, this uh, coming through from the dutch news agency uh, the government won its appeal that it is and has now been deemed able to limit flights at the airport from November of this year to October of next. So this will impose further restrictions on the ability of airlines to operate there, limit the capacity. The case had been brought by airlines, including KLM, Delta, EasyJet and an IATA Transport Association lobbying group, but they clearly have not won and the Dutch government has won this. A spokesperson for KLM uh, couldn't be reached for comment. Interestingly, we see Air France KLM share price had actually been uh, climbing since we got this news up by 1.9% this morning. Coming up on the programme, something entirely different. Mattel could be left tickled pink if its big bet on the Barbie movie pays off. We've got more on what could lie ahead for the US toy, uh, toy maker and what do we take away from this sort of doubling down on these legacy brands? This is Bloomberg. The conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Anna Edwards in for Francine Lacroix in London. Life in plastic could be apparently fantastic if Mattel's bet on $100 million feminist Barbie movie pays off. Today's Bloomberg Big Take story is all about the toy makers' gamble on one of this year's most hotly anticipated films. It's the best day ever. It is the best day ever. So is yesterday and so is tomorrow and every day from now until forever. <laughs> The most popular doll of all time, Barbie, is finally getting her own movie. So cool. The film, which is directed by Greta Gerwig and stars Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling, will poke fun at a lot of the very things the toy has been criticized for. Or you can know the truth about the universe. Let me the idealized fantasy that Barbie encapsulates has undergone revamps before. In 2016, new body types and better careers were introduced, but Barbie's origins have been hard to overcome, and for good reason. Her looks were based on the Lily doll, a foot-tall, busty blonde, which wasn't actually made for kids. German men passed her around bachelor parties as a joke gift. Mattel's then-CEO, Ruth Handler, discovered Lily on a family trip. 
She'd seen her own daughter toss aside baby dolls in favor of paper dolls, creating stories about their fashionable grown-up existences. So Handler decided to create a tiny 3D model with which children could play out their dreams of adulthood. And soon after Barbie hit the shelves, Mattel became the largest toy company in the world. For decades, Barbie was a huge success, usually accounting for about a third to a half of Mattel's revenue. And despite being anatomically preposterous, since so few women were actually running companies or winning political office, Barbie, the US president, the surgeon, or the corporate executive became a role model. But with the rise of video games, some marketing missteps, just a greater awareness of eating disorders and body politics, Barbie came to be viewed as out of step and sales fell every year between 2011 and 2015. What do I have to do? This summer's potential blockbuster is designed to showcase changes Barbie and society have undergone. It's also part of the business model Mattel's current CEO, Enon Kreis, has been trying to establish since 2018. Kreis wants Mattel to operate more like Disney, which has created a multiverse of movies, products, shows, and theme parks off of Marvel and Star Wars characters. There are more than a dozen other movies now in production based on Mattel toys, including Hot Wheels, Uno cards, and even Magic 8-Balls. Now, making the transition will be tough. Mattel has tried and failed many times to move away from the cyclical toy manufacturing business and has never pulled off the pivot. But maybe this time it's different, because the Hollywood trade press, from Variety to Rotten Tomatoes, has pegged Barbie as one of the most anticipated movies of 2023. I'm sure, I am sure that some will love the movie, some will absolutely hate it. Just looking at the Barbies that are available these days, for those who are interested in that market, there's plenty with flat feet and yoga mats, but there are plenty of the anatomically preposterous variety, as was described in that, uh, in that uh, amusing piece there. Now you can read more about Mattel's big bet on the Barbie movie in today's Big Take story. Well worth a read. Really interesting business story about how you can extend brands, even ones that are decades old. Now before we go, time to talk you through the markets and what we are watching. First up at 1 o'clock UK time, we'll get CPI data coming through from Mexico. Uh, we will also get one, uh, well, the big data point of the day, essentially 1.30pm US non-farm pay Rolls. Uh, the figure we're looking for for June is around 230,000. Whisper numbers, though, in the high 200,000. So we'll watch for how hot, hot that can come in. We had the ADP report. It's imperfect links to non-farm payrolls, well known, but worth keeping an eye on that, of course. And at the same time, we'll get Canadian unemployment figures. Lastly, the Aix-en-Provence Economic Forum kicks off in France today. It is, a, from an economic perspective, star-studied event, sometimes uh, dubbed the French Davos. It's attended by dozens of ministers, executives and central bank officials. We will have plenty of sound coming through from the Exxon Provence events at the early part of next week. We'll be talking to Laurence Boone, that's one of the, the ministers in attendance later today and over the weekend we're talking to Sanofi's CEO and we have an exclusive sit down with Mario Centino, the ECB governing council member. Up next, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, they'll continue to take you through the markets with this uh, higher yield dynamic, lower stocks as we wait for the jobs report. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>